This video is on the rapture. And the reason why I am making a video about the rapture in an Antichrist playlist is because many Antichrist spirits have been trying to make the subject of the rapture very confusing. There are a lot of teachings and a lot of views out there that people adhere to, some of which are there's a pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture and a post-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture and a post-tribulation rapture, or only a post-tribulation rapture. And these are just some of them. Now, what I'm going to be doing in this video is I'm just going to go through what the Bible says about the rapture. However, I'm going to be covering what the scriptures call the harvest. Technically, a lot of people talk about the rapture, but what the rapture actually is, is the harvesting of God's people. So I'm going to be speaking about specifically the subject of the harvest, which technically indirectly covers the rapture. Another reason why I'm also doing this video is because this year Jesus convicted me of an area where I fell short in a lifestyle that he had trained me in. The reason why I fell short was because I wasn't believing specific things that he had stated the way that he wanted me to believe and to have an expectation for. Very quickly, because I don't want to make this video long, my last few have been a little bit long, one night before going to bed, my brother asked me what I was expecting that night, and I told him I was expecting absolutely nothing. That night I had a dream. In fact, we both had the exact same dream. He was in one location in the dream, and I was in another. I found out the next morning when I woke up and I told him about it, and he was able to recite the same location and everything. In this dream, I was severely corrected regarding my mindset of what Jesus' desire was for taking up his bride. In that dream, Jesus quoted to me a scripture and using this scripture, he explained why I was supposed to expect what he had stated. After having this experience, I repented and continued in the mindset that he wanted me to have, which ironically has to do with this very video and the subject on the rapture. So if I don't believe what I'm actually presenting to you all right now, it's counted as sin. And it's because Jesus has been training me in the past four or five years in a very different way that he has before regarding just my lifestyle and how I live here on earth. And it does circulate around being prepared to be taken out of here. Now, I'm going to go into what the scriptures say about the subject now. The very first scripture I'm going to talk about is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 to 23. I'm not going to be reading all these scriptures out to try and keep these videos short. As you can see on the screen, you can see the scripture there. Paul here states that Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, he became the first fruits of all those who had slept, all of those who have died. Then later on, by verse 22, he makes it very clear that regarding the resurrection, in Christ, all will be made alive, but each in his own order, a first fruits Christ, then those who are Christ's at his coming. Right here, everyone. The Bible makes it pretty clear that the harvest, when Jesus takes up his people, it has two stages. It has a stage of the first fruits, and then it has the stage of the full harvest, which is at Jesus' coming. A lot of people like to say that this first fruits Christ is Jesus. This makes absolutely no sense if you read the rest of the context, which I started off at 20. Paul already made it clear that Jesus was raised from the dead and was the first fruits of all who had died. Then he speaks about everyone else, saying that in Christ all will be made alive, but each in their own order. This is a future tense statement, which means it can't include Jesus, who's already alive. And it says all in their own order, which means there's more than one in this lineup. There's two, which he points out. I don't really need to say very much regarding the subject, actually, from here. This actually alone covers the entire subject of how many raptures are there. It's very clear that if we look at the rapture as a harvest, there are two taking ups. One's the first fruits, then there's a group of people at his coming. But I'm going to continue to go through this in a much more thorough manner. I'm not going to just leave you with the scripture, although technically I should be able to. This subject comes up later on as well. In the book of Revelations, John received the same order. If we go to Revelations chapter 14, verse 1 to 5, 
it talks about a group of people called the 144,000. Now, regarding this group of people, in verse 3, it indicates that they're singing a new song before the throne of God. Verse 4 says that these are redeemed by Jesus from among men, the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They are the first fruits. John identifies a group of people and calls them the first fruits. Now, I also want to note that this section here isn't saying that these first fruits were caught up and brought up into heaven in this exact chapter. This is a snapshot of them already being in heaven. As for when they go to heaven, we'll cover that in a moment. Now, if you continue reading chapter 14, when you come to the end, you find that there's a harvest. Chapter 14, verse 14 to 19, speaks of two harvests. One is the harvest of the earth, which is a group of good people. Then the second one is a harvest of the grapes of the earth, which are fully ripe. These guys get tossed into wrath. This is a group of bad people. What John sees here in Revelations chapter 14 is an illustration of a first fruits of the harvest being taken, and then when the harvest time comes, the angels harvest a batch of good people and a batch of bad people. This whole setup is completely consistent with what Jesus said in parables. If you go to Matthew 24, verse 37 to 42, Jesus says, Just as the days of Noah, so will his coming be. He mentions how they're all eating and drinking and given into marriage and being married until Noah entered into the ark. Then the flood came and took them all away, and that's how his coming will be. He mentions here, then two will be in the field, one will be taken in, and one will be sent away. Two will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken in, and one will be sent away. Please note that in this translation that you see here, it states taken in and sent away. Most Bibles do not translate this this way. But if you were to check the Greek concordance on what these words state, these are the accurate words. Taken in, the Greek word here actually means taken into intimacy, as in brought closer to someone. The left that you see in most scriptures is actually sent away, which means to send someone away, loose them, put them away, very similar to divorce. This is very important because most Bibles translate this wrong, and a lot of people have developed a lot of views regarding the rapture on these verses. Yet these verses are consistent with the rest of the theme of Matthew 24 and 25. With the virgins, you see that the wise are brought in, they're taken in, and the foolish are sent away. With the parable of the minna, there's the servants that are received in in given cities, and then there's a servant who is sent away. With the sheep and the goats, there's the sheep that are received in, and then there's the goats that are sent away into the eternal fires. This is completely consistent. To further solidify how consistent this is and what these sent away people are going to be experiencing, if you take a look at the exact same parable in Luke 17, Jesus indicates that two will be in the field, one will be taken in, and the other one will be sent away. They ask him, where, Lord? And then he says, where the body is, there will the vultures also be gathered together. Jesus said this, and interestingly enough, Revelations chapter 19, verse 17 to 18, and verse 21 explains what this vultures and birds gathering means. These people are slayed by the word of God. They're slayed by the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth, and the birds eat their flesh. They devour them. And this group, by the way, does include Christians. It includes churches. Jesus warned the church of Pergamum regarding their acts that if they don't repent, he will come and make war with them with the very same sword that comes out of his mouth. So again... We have here a group of Noahs entering into an ark. I'm not sure if you guys noticed that, but he said. There's a group of Noahs that enter into an ark. And then all of a sudden there's a flood that comes, and then there's a harvest of people. Some are taken in, and some are sent away. Those that are sent away are eaten by birds, sent into eternal fires. They're under wrath. The Bible is completely consistent with this type of imagery. Now, I mentioned earlier that with the first fruits in Revelations chapter 14, I was going to indicate when they went up to God. Well, in Revelations chapter 12, verse 5, we see that there's a man child who's caught up to the throne of God. If you read Revelations 11 all the way to 14 to the end, it's pretty seamless. 
you have the same characters. You have a dragon, you have a beast, you have a woman who's given the wings of an eagle. This eagle is part of the same beasts we see in Daniel chapter 7 with the lion, the panther, the bear, and so on. From the end of chapter 11 to the end of chapter 14, it's pretty seamless. It's a fair assumption that the first fruits who are seen by the throne of God is this very man-child who's taken up to the throne of God. After that, Satan is cast down to the earth. Then we see the whole Revelation chapter 13 mess. And then we see Revelations 14 with these guys already in heaven. And then shortly after that, there's the full harvest. And as I said before, regarding Matthew 24, we see that there's a group of Noahs that enter into the ark before this flood comes. These first fruits are part of that Noah. Now to further solidify this point, I'm actually going to talk about the marriage very quickly. As we all know, the bride of Christ is supposed to marry Jesus. The Bible says the holy city, New Jerusalem, is the bride of Christ. Well, what I find very interesting is that in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 36, it's made explicitly clear that when Jesus returns for the harvest, this is after the tribulation is finished, the last hour is finished, this is when he comes with his angels and, and the trumpets and everything. When he returns, Luke 12, 36 says, be like men watching for their Lord. That's Jesus. When he returns from the marriage, that when he comes and knocks, they may immediately open to him. Then from 37 to 40, has a very stern warning on being ready. And the rest of this chapter lines up with what it says in Matthew 24 as well. So the point in bringing this up is, the Bible explicitly states that when Jesus returns to do the harvest, he's already married to someone. He's already returned from a marriage. Who are these people that he married that he's returning with? Who is it that Jesus is married? He's returning from a marriage. It's crystal clear. If anyone is still doubting this, read the rest of the verses. Luke 12, 42 to 46. If you take a look at those verses, I have them displayed here. And if you line them up with Matthew 24, 45 to 51, which is clearly at the end of the Great Tribulation after Jesus returns, it's the same thing being said. So we know that this returning of Jesus is at the time he judges the nations. And here it's stating that Jesus is coming back from a wedding. The situation here, guys, is that the first fruits are the first to receive full salvation. They're the first ones to partake of this glorious promise that Jesus has given his bride, his church. They're the first ones to taste of it. This is why Revelations chapter 12, verse 10, after the man-child goes up, it explicitly states, Now has come salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. Now has come the salvation. This group of people are the first people to move into the holy city. This is why they can be called bride as well. To further solidify this point, if you go to John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, Jesus said some very profound things here. This is the verse that I saw in my dream. I'm going to read it to you as it came to me in my dream. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Then in my dream, after this was stated, I saw the words in all caps with an exclamation, EXPECT! When I saw that expect, instantly I was gripped and I realized, wow, okay, I, I need to believe this. I need to expect this. When I woke up, I understood fully because I remembered the things I said before going to bed that I didn't expect anything. Now, in the dream, after I saw the expect, in the dream, I was told why I needed to expect. The message continued, saying, If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll receive you to myself that where I am, you may be there also. Guys, a lot of people haven't really noticed, but this here, what Jesus said, this is not talking about a return to judge the nations and everyone sees him. What he stated here is he's going to be coming back to receive some people to himself and take them back to where he is. This lines up perfectly with the first fruits Christ. Isaiah chapter 13 even mentions that when 
God comes to judge the nations. He's coming back with an army from a faraway country, and it's the saints. And it says that they come from heaven. It's these people who Jesus took away to be with him that are coming back with him. It's these people who first partook of the marriage. They're the first fruits of the marriage. They're the first fruits of the harvest of the church. A lot of people think there's only two comings of Jesus, but the Bible technically teaches three. There's the one that's already taken place where he came through the Virgin Mary, as we know. And then there's the one that I just quoted with Jesus saying he's going to come back and take people back to be with him, which mirrors what Hebrews chapter 9 says. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time without sin to those who are eagerly waiting for him for salvation. It states here that he's appearing to those who are eagerly waiting for him for salvation. This lines up again with what Revelation chapter 12 says. In verse 10, it said salvation came, and it came to that man-child. It came to the woman. They were delivered. That's what birthing means. It's deliverance. There are people who are eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back right now, and Jesus is going to honor that. He is going to come for them. It's a promise. A lot of people do not believe this. And in order to eagerly wait for Jesus... It would only make sense that you actually believe that it's going to happen. A lot of people don't believe. Therefore, I question how eager their waiting is. Now, if you take a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, this talks about a, a specific appearing of Jesus where everyone sees him. It says, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. This is a completely different appearing than what Hebrews chapter 9 says. Hebrews chapter 9 says he appears to those who are eagerly waiting for him for salvation. This one says he appears to all eyes. Hebrews chapter 9 is first fruits. Revelations chapter 1 verse 7. That's when the rest of the harvest is taken and everyone sees it. I just want to make it clear one more time. The Bible does show clear evidence that before Jesus returns to judge the nations and does the full harvest, there is a first fruits harvest. And I also want to make it clear, I'm not trying to say this is pre-last hour, as in great tribulation, or right after. I'm not trying to pinpoint a time frame. All I am stating here is what the Bible explicitly states. I do have my opinions on it, but I'm not sharing that. I'm just trying to show to you guys that the Bible does say that there is an order and there is a group of people who are taken before the end comes when he harvests the whole batch. Now, on to the last point of this video. The question is, why is this so important to believe? Why do we have to believe that there is a group of people being taken out of here before Jesus returns to then take the whole harvest? Well, it's pretty simple. Number one, I mean, the Bible does show that this is the case. It shows that there's a first fruits harvest, right? I mean, we should be believing what the Bible says. But more importantly, how can we prepare for something that we do not believe is going to take place? Sadly, there's a lot of people who do not believe that there is going to be a first fruits harvest, that there is going to be a group of people taken out of here before Jesus returns to judge the nations, and that he returns with when it's time for him to judge the nations. The reason why this is so detrimental and how it can become antichrist, apart from the fact that it goes against what the Bible says, is that the people who preach like this, who are anti-first fruits harvest, if they were called to be part of that first fruits harvest, they could easily miss out. And they can cause others who may have been called to be part of this first fruits harvest to be disqualified through unbelief. The scriptures does speak about a disqualification that can happen with us because of unbelief. It's what happened to the Israel of old. They did not believe and it led them into disobedience. So this is really the number one reason why it makes sense to simply believe it. And I'm not even saying sit here and believe everything I'm saying. I'm just saying, believe what Jesus said, and believe what Paul said, and believe what the book of Revelations outlines as well, and then let Jesus guide you into the proper order he's looking for with you.
it does not make sense for us to disqualify ourselves or for us to be disqualified because we heard someone else preach saying this doesn't happen or it's not happening. It makes more sense to just believe the scriptures and entrust Jesus, put your faith in Jesus. And I'm saying this through my own testimony where Jesus himself corrected me telling me to expect this. It is possible to be called to be part of the first fruits harvest, be disqualified because of unbelief, which leads to disobedience, which causes you to miss the time of your order. It is very possible. And I wouldn't want that to happen with anyone. That's part of the reason why I'm also making this video. The last point I'm going to be making regarding this final point is that no one should be doubting whether or not they can partake of being part of the first fruits because there's a set number of 144,000 according to the book of Revelations and according to if we take it literally. No one should be doubting that because, again, that's not really your call. It's Jesus' call and he's the one who organizes. All you have to do is just go back to Jesus, ask him for yourself, and let him tell you what he's doing with you and believe what he tells you. If Jesus says, yes, I'm calling you to be part of this, believe him. Do not doubt. And if he tells you no, don't fret, believe it. That does not necessarily mean that you have to go through the tribulation and go through all this pain and anguish and all this other stuff. Because remember, the woman who gives birth to the man-child, she's kept in the wilderness. She is kept. And she is the other part of the Noahs that I mentioned earlier in the video. I'm not going to go into all the detail regarding that. I'm trying to make this video short. But the point is, whatever Jesus has prescribed for you, Ask him about it thoroughly and believe it. And then do what he says to prepare. Follow him and obey him. Enter into that rest where you rest from your own works, cease from sin, keep yourself set apart from this world, and wait for him. Believe whatever Jesus tells you about yourself. Obviously, make sure it gets refined. Make sure you continue to pray and press and ask Jesus about it and seek him. Don't just ask once and then take whatever answer. The point I'm trying to stress here is trust Jesus with your identity of who you are. Do not disqualify yourself for any reason, especially because you see numbers and think, okay, well, I can never be part of that. That's not the attitude we're supposed to take. If Abraham thought like that, if Noah thought like that, none of us would be here today being able to call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. How would the promises have been fulfilled? And lastly, with the 144,000, it's mentioned that those guys are from the 12 tribes of Israel. I have a playlist that's going to be speaking about the 12 tribes of Israel, New Covenant Israel, and the things that Paul was teaching regarding who's a Jew and who Israel is in this New Covenant. So I'm not going to go through that here and now. This playlist I'm speaking about is about three playlists away from this one. Now I'm going to end this video here. My next video is going to cover... Jesus's return because I made some statements indicating that some people are going to believe that Jesus is the Antichrist when he comes back. I'm going to explain a little bit more where I was coming from with that just so there's no confusion. I've had a little bit of feedback from some people so I'm going to clear that up. I'm very thankful for that by the way. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to cover that as well as a little bit of the return of Jesus and what the judgments the scriptures say about what the judgment looks like. Because a lot of Christians have slaughtered themselves in places that when Jesus returns, a lot of people are going to be shocked at where their position is and why. So I'm going to be covering a little bit of that in the next video. And that next video should be the last video of this playlist, unless Jesus gives me something else in the future.